All right. Hey, everybody. It's starting to get a little cold out today, so I decided to bust out the jacket again. Yeah, I slowly phased out the jacket. I haven't worn it for a few videos. Did anybody notice? You, you noticed. Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, busted out the jacket again. Also, Barry is back. Uh, I should clarify something with him. I saw a few comments in the last video, like, uh, you broke Barry and replaced him with a different brick, didn't you, Tekking? I'm like, no. No, it's the same Barry. Barry has a very distinct birthmark, in case you don't know. Uh, half of Barry's head has uh, taken a chunk out of it, and it was like that um, when he was created at the dawn of time. Uh, prior to the Big Bang, uh, Barry existed like this. So there you go. It's, it's actually very hard to replicate. You know, you, most bricks actually look very different from each other. If I ever swapped out Barry, I think most astute viewers would be able to tell. All right, so uh, it's Friday, but there's no new One Piece chapter today. Although there's a new Hunter Hunter chapter. I keep forgetting to bring that up, but Hunter Hunter is back in serialization. I don't think you need me to tell you that. I think it's pretty obvious. You go check it out. Everybody's been mentioning it, but uh, some really good chapters of Hunter Hunter. So I might talk about those at some point. But today, Today we are going to be analyzing Bartholomew Kuma's life as much as we know about it right now because this can get a little confusing because the dude was a king and then he was also a member of the Revolutionary Army but then he was also a part of the Warlords which is part of the world government but then he's also a cyborg but he also has connections to Vegapunk who also has connections to the Revolutionary Army who's also, oh by the way, Kuma's also Bonnie's dad and he was apparently the tyrant but he was apparently a nice guy. A lot of conflicting reports here seem to be be with Kuma's character and uh, considering like as of right now in the story from what we understand he is a mindless robot he is the PX zero his brain has been wiped with all memories and morals and personality he is a mindless thoughtless, just emotionless robot that does whatever people around him tell him to do. Um, I guess there's still some organic components in him, like he still might actually have a human brain, unless Vegapunk like removed it and put like a CPU in there or something. I don't know. I don't know computers. He put the motherboard inside of the DNA chip inside of the neural net processor or whatever i don't know anyway um so yeah he still probably has maybe something in there that could hold memories maybe vegapunk is holding on to the file and he'll upload it at some point and then kuma will return to who he was and he'll be like ah it's good to be back now i will reveal my entire backstory to all of you um but unless you know that never happens or it'll be a while till we get to that point let's let's look through kuma's past and see what we can uh, piece together here all right so Let's start at the beginning, I guess, the basic stuff that we know for kind of certain. Uh, Kuma is 47 years old. That was confirmed in the data books and everything, so it's in all likelihood that he was born 47 years ago. From what we understand, he was born in the South Blue in the Sorbet Kingdom. This is the land, this is the kingdom he would eventually become the king of. Was he a kind and benevolent king, or was he a cruel, malicious king? Don't really know. It depends on who you're asking, okay? Okay, but he was born 47 years ago in the um, Sorbet Kingdom. Now, we don't know much about Kuma's parents. However, it's important to mention that when Bonnie was at the Reverie and she used her abilities to turn into an old woman, she was confused for the Dowager Queen of the Sorbet Kingdom named Connie. Now, that got me to believe that, like, oh, well, what if that was Bonnie's real form? We later find out that is not the case. Bonnie is, like, 20-something years old because she was an actual child 20 years ago uh, when she visited Egghead Island, okay? Not through the use of her ability to change her age. She was, like, an actual kid 20 years ago. Ago, all right, so that got me thinking that like what if Connie was Kuma's wife or Kuma's you know like a uh, queen of the Sorbet Kingdom and that's the situation of why when Bonnie ages herself she looks like her and a lot of people were quick to bring up he's like well it, it probably wouldn't be Kuma's wife because Kuma's in his 40s his wife would probably be around the same age it was probably honestly Bonnie's grandmother that would have been actually Connie okay who's probably still alive and living in the Sorbet Kingdom as the Dowager Queen so we don't know much for certain, but like it seems to be that Kuma's mom is Connie and we don't know Kuma's father. We don't know anything about him. But then Kuma was born 47 years ago and then eventually he grew up and had Bonnie somewhere around his 20s. OK, and then Bonnie is around her 20s right now. All right. That makes sense. Now. 
We do, as Oda drew all of the warlords when they were children, that includes Kuma as well. So here we have this image of Kuma when he was a little kid. And this in itself gives us some interesting backstory on the kind of person he was at the time, all right? So we see Kuma here uh, without his hats or his trademark, like, you know, big uh, coat. Uh, he's not carrying a Bible. He's actually carrying another book that says Nino Keen on it. So we'll get back to that in a moment. But he's uh, carrying a lot of uh, heavy wood on his back, and he seems to be wearing uh, clothing that doesn't seem very indicative of a prince. You know, the idea goes that if Kuma was the king of the Sorbet Kingdom, it implies, since most monarchies are passed down hereditarily, it would imply that either, you know, his father or grandfather or somebody was the king of Sorbet before he was. And then he would have been born as Prince Bartholomew Kuma, and then grew up and became the king when his father passed away, or you know, you know, passed the throne on to him, or whatever, you know. Um, however, However, the way that Kuma is depicted as a child, that really doesn't seem to be the case. He seems to be like a really hardworking uh, peasant, if nothing else. And the indication for that is actually in what the book says. Nino Keen is actually a reference to a Japanese philosopher by the name of Nino Miya Kinjiro, also known as Nino Miya Sontoku. He received an honorary title from the daimyo later on in his life. Now I'm gonna try not to go off on a huge tangent here, but this is relevant because it could give us a hint into Kuma's past a little bit, because Oda is making a reference here to a specific person that actually lived uh, during the Edo period, actually the very tail end of the Edo period. Uh, Nino Miya Kinjiro actually passed away in 1856, which was like right at the beginning of the Bakumatsu period, at the end of the Edo period, okay? But he was a philosopher and a farmer, basically, and um, I only got a chance to read the bare bones of his story, but I'm honestly very, like, intrigued by this dude. Like, I'm gonna try to find a book or something and read more about this guy's life, okay? So, Ninomiya Kinjiro was born into a peasant family during the Edo period of Japan, all right? So he was not of noble birth or anything like that, okay? His father died when he was uh, 14 years old, and his mother passed away when uh, he was 16 years old, all right? So he's not even 18 years old, and he lost both of his parents. So he goes to live with his uncle. And while he's living with his uncle, he's basically doing, he's studying in his free time, he's trying to read as much as possible, he's trying to learn as much as he can about agriculture and philosophy and all that kind of jazz, right? So eventually, he basically gets a abandoned plot of land, like this just empty, vacant lot, basically. It's just like, here, this is yours, do whatever you want with it. And he managed to turn it into a thriving agricultural community where people actually began to live. And he became sort of like the landlord or like, the, the not a lord, but like he became the owner of this land that people lived on, which back then was like kind of step one in gathering some status, okay? And so slowly but surely, in actually a very impressive story, the man began to rise to prominence you know he had this small plot of land and then there was a lord in the area that was just like hey uh Nino Mia, you're doing really well with managing this area how about I give you a slightly larger area to manage that's been having some financial difficulties and so he takes it over and he revitalizes the economy and using his agricultural you know uh, knowledge he manages to make that area really big and so that got the attention of the daimyo of the region who put him in charge of Odawara. Odawara was was like a, a decently sized area of land in the Kanto region of Japan in Kanagawa Prefecture. It had a castle and everything. So he went from being peasant to managing a little plot of land and then a bigger plot of land and now pretty much an entire area with a castle and everything, okay? Eventually he was even given uh, basically uh, command over one of the shoguns, like uh, private like residences. Obviously the shogun probably had a bunch of different areas that they lived in, but he was basically given like command over that specific area. And so, yeah, it was kind of like a situation where dude starts out as a peasant and then rises to prominence. He never becomes a daimyo himself or a lord or anything like that on that level. Um, but still, pretty impressive given his upbringing and stuff like that, especially during the time period. So there's more about this guy, and he was eventually by the shogun given the title of Ninomiya Sontoku, um, you know, later on in his life, okay? So this is um, very interesting because it makes me wonder if Oda is being, like, direct with this. You know, if this is, like, the story of Kuma like this Ninomiya Kinjiro person from our world, right? Like, did he start as not a prince or maybe his parents were not actually royalty or something, but then he rose to prominence and became the ruler, all right? And just by connection, when he became the king, his parents also gained royalty status and his kids would also gain royalty status too. I guess this makes Bonnie a princess 
of Sorbet, like, you know, just by going with the monarchy and everything, I, I suppose it would, right? Well, maybe it doesn't because he was de deposed of later, and we'll see what happened with that. But by all accounts, you know, Ninomiya Sontoku was an upstanding citizen. He was very moral, he was a philosopher, and to this day in Japan, around schools, notably elementary schools, there'll be a statue of him reading a book while carrying a bunch of, like, uh, firewood and stuff on his back, indicating that Ninomiya always studied every single, you know, hour of the day while working very hard in the process, and that gives you, like, the work ethic to eventually succeed in life. Like, that's the general vibe that you get from his story, okay? So that is how Oda depicted Kuma as a child in that same vein, which indicates a few things. Maybe it might have just been an artistic choice, but I really think there's something else going on here where the stories do connect back. And the book that he's carrying is Nino Kin, which Nino Mia Kinjiro, it's kind of like the shortened version of that, moving some kanji around, that's where you get it from that. Eventually he would start reading the Bible wherever he would go, and that's how you can kind of tell the real Kuma from like the PX, uh, you know, one, two, or three, or whatever, like when the real one's actually holding the Bible. So there you go. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're not even into Kuma being an adult yet, but we already have some indications on his character. Okay, he doesn't seem to be a tyrant. He doesn't seem to be a despot or anything like that. In fact, Ninomiya Kinjiro was uh, very much a supporter of, like, Confucianism and Buddhism and Shinto and that kind of stuff. And Confucius was all about, during the Zhou Dynasty, was all about virtue and morality and ruling with compassion and everything, not ruling like a despot and being cruel to, like, the, um, the common folk and everything like that. So I know this gets a little bit confusing, but essentially we have Confucius, uh, lived during 500 BC, during the Zhou Dynasty, who taught, you know, virtue and morality and tradition are the key factors to being a well-loved and respected king over a land. Then we have during the Edo period, which is like, well, well over 2,000 years after the time Confucius lived, we had uh, Ninomiya Kinjiro, who followed in Confucius's footsteps and, you know, talked about his philosophy to people and was a very accomplished man in his own right. And then we have Kuma, who is clearly, as a child, modeled after statues of Ninomiya Kinjiro all over Japan. So there, there seems to be an indication here that Oda's going with, yes, Kuma is, at his core, a very kind-hearted individual. Uh, he's not a tyrant, okay? So where did the image of him being a tyrant even come from, okay? Well... This enters a part of Kuma's life we don't really know much about him during his teenage years or when he was an adult. We obviously know at some point during Kuma's 20s, that was when Bonnie was born, we get to see a uh, flashback in the, one of the most recent chapters of Kuma holding up Bonnie, and this was before he had any cybernetic enhancements. By the way, I just realized, you know how Kuma's eyes are like rectangular and they look like robotic? Well, that's because they're robot eyes probably, and back in the day he obviously didn't have those, so he was wearing glasses and everything. So yeah, it, I, I always used to think on Honestly, Kuma was wearing, like, sunglasses or something. It took me a while to realize those are his actual eyes that were probably just replaced by Vegapunk. Anyway, so we see Kuma there in his 20s being a very kind and nurturing father uh, to Bonnie, okay? By the way, I should also bring up at this point if Bonnie has any brothers or sisters. Uh, they were never mentioned if she does. I just thought it would be important to bring up because we just don't know much about Kuma. He might have had other kids. Maybe Bonnie was an only child. Who knows, okay? Just something to keep in mind. All right, so this is where the story kind of splits, though, depending on who you you're asking, okay? If you're asking probably most citizens in the One Piece world, as in the information and history that is passed down from the world government, and they're the ones that kind of educate the youth of the One Piece world, if you ask anybody like that, they're going to say that Kuma was a despotic tyrant that ruled over Sorbet with an iron fist, until eventually the citizens of his nation rebelled against him and threw him out. So he was forced to become a pirate, at this point, the world government captured him, and he had connections to the Revolutionary Army, but before he was executed, Vegapunk basically spoke up and said, hey, um, you know, Kuma's body is very impressive. His body, you know, is very impressive and all that, and also Kuma is connected to a special race in the One Piece world, could be Lunarians. We'll get to back to that in a second. And so, therefore, uh, his uh, sentence was essentially pardoned, and Vegapunk, you know, took Kuma off to work in the Pacifista program, okay? So, remodeling his whole body, taking his, you know, lineage factor out of him, his blood samples, his DNA, and making a bunch of clones of him, uh, clones of him essentially becoming the first generation of Pacifista, which would eventually become the Seraphim, okay, including make a making a Seraphim of Kuma himself that we saw the CP0 returning to Egghead with, okay? So that's, that's the official story, and that was the story Jinbei told to Bonnie. 
Jinbei was like, hey, this is what I've heard. And Jinbei was a warlord. He worked alongside Kuma, sort of, kind of. I mean, the warlords very rarely ever got together to actually work together. Uh, really, the only time that ever happened was Marineford, and even then, like, some of the warlords, like Jinbei, did not agree to do that, even. Uh, so just because they were both warlords doesn't mean they were, like, buddy-buddy or anything like that. But that was the story most people knew. So then you have the other story, which is most likely the truth, whereas the other, you know, story that's spread around the world is a false uh, propaganda spread by the world government more than likely, you have the story that Bonnie tells. Bonnie, being the daughter of Kuma, would know him better than pretty much everybody. Uh, Bonnie says that my father was not a tyrant, he was a kind man, but he did hate the world government with a passion. So now when Bonnie's explaining the story, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Let me paint a little bit of an image for you here, okay? Going along with what we know and we've discussed so far with Kuma's past, all right? Let's say Kuma, let's say the Sorbet Kingdom, maybe it was his father, maybe it was somebody else, but there was a tyrannical ruler of Sorbet, maybe Kuma's dad or his grandfather or somebody else unrelated. Kuma began his life as a peasant, just like Nino Mia did. OK, and so he had to go through his life and he just, you know, read as much as he could. He learned about the world. He started studying philosophy. Kuma began to second guess pretty much everything about the world, the world that the world government was, you know, uh, you know, explaining about, like the history and the way that you should live and, you know, like obey the kings and everything like that, obey the world government and all that kind of stuff. Kuma began to second guess all that stuff. He began to read about philosophy and he's just like, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's not how a ruler should be. Right. And so what if Kuma eventually rose to prominence and he became the new king of Sorbet? So what if the citizens of Sorbet did rise up? up to dispose of their monarch, but it wasn't Kuma, it was the person that came before Kuma, all right? And so they got rid of that dude, whoever it was, and then Kuma became the next king. Not really something hereditary, maybe he was just made the new king. Like, oh, that old king sucks. Who do we want to be the new king? That guy! Kuma's like, me? It's like, yeah, Kuma, you should be the new king. You're a nice guy. And be like, okay. And then he knew a lot about philosophy and morality and virtue and agriculture and whatever and revitalizing the economy or whatever. And Sorbet became a really nice nation. It became a really nice kingdom with Kuma leading it, okay? However... Kuma's philosophy was still against the world government's philosophy, okay? And I can even imagine all the different things that happened there. I'm sure maybe when Kuma, if he attended the reverie back in the day, I'm sure he probably said a few things that the world government, that the Gorosei weren't really fond of. You know, I'm sure if there was anybody that would have said something, it would have been Kuma. Kuma would have been like back in the day, he would have been like, hey, so um, maybe we can uh, get rid of the uh, heavenly tribute that the Tenerubito always require, it seems really like way too high for most of the kingdoms in the world, and the world would probably be a better off place if the Heavenly Tribute didn't even exist. Actually, it would probably be a better system if the Tenerubito didn't even exist. Like, Bartholomew Kuma might have brought that kind of stuff to the Reverie, and the Gorosei were like, ha 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 ha, oh, we gotta get rid of this guy. You know, like, it might have been a situation like that, right? Where Kuma was, like, very outspoken with um, the way the government was run by the Tenerubito and the Heavenly Tributes and everything, and and uh, yeah, so, uh, but meanwhile, meanwhile, his kingdom is being run perfectly fine. Everybody's happy at the Sorbet Kingdom. He gets married. He has a daughter. That's Bonnie. And everything seems to be going good. Okay. Okay. Well, the government's, but, you know, also that kind of philosophy would also lead him to connect with the Revolutionary Army. Now, I'm not sure if Kuma became a member of the Revolutionary Army while he was still king of Sorbet, or wasn't that wasn't something until he got kicked out. Now, how did he get kicked out? Because if the people liked him and if he was a good king, why would the people suddenly turn on him? Well, I have two explanations for that. Either, number one, it was a situation like with what happened with Doflamingo. As we saw with Tres Rosa, in one single night, basically Doflamingo, using his abilities and his influence, were able to, uh, you know, uh, paint the entire picture of King Riku Dold III as an evil king that tried to slaughter all of his citizens, okay? He went from being a very nicely respected king to being a horrible despot in a single night. Not because he was, but because of Doflamingo's treachery, okay? And his manipulation and parasite threads and all that kind of jazz, right? So, it could definitely happen. So, there might 
have been something like that, where maybe the government sends Cypherpole over to the Sorbet Kingdom, and they infiltrate the island, and they dress up as regular citizens, and they begin to seed dissent amongst the populace. They begin to say things like, oh, you think, uh, you know, King Bartholomew Kuma is such a nice guy. Well, did you know in actuality he's doing this horrible thing in the background, or he's allying with the Tenor Vito, or he's planning on selling out the entire island, or whatever? You know, Cypherpole Zero agents, not even probably uh, Cypherpole Zero agents, Cypherpole 2 or 3 or 4 agents, just regular members of Cypherpole going around the island and just seeding dissent. And then eventually maybe they begin to, like, you know, uh, eliminate some of the citizens, like, and they pin it on Kuma, and then all of the people lose faith in him, and it's like two sides of the same coin kind of a situation, and then they kick him out that way. And so he had no choice but to leave the kingdom, and he's in like, oh, why would this happen to me? I didn't do any of that. Why would this happen? And then he left, and then he became a member of the Revolutionary Army because he had to, okay? Another option with this is that... Um, Kuma was actually, uh, he chose to leave, essentially. Uh, the world government might have come after him, or maybe they might have threatened him. They might have said that, like, hey, if you don't go quietly, or if you don't leave the nation, you know, we're going to come after you, and we're going to burn your city or burn your kingdom to the ground. It could have been a threat like that or something. And then Sukuma, out of respect for his, you know, he doesn't want anything bad to befall his citizens. He's a good king. So he's like, and even his daughter, he's like, I have to leave everybody behind. So he left everybody and went out to sea, because if he didn't, you know, the world government was going to do something to his land, okay? Also, the world government was probably very jealous of the fact that he could run such a good kingdom in the South Blue that might become a problem later on because, you know, dissent might spread. You know, if Kuma is the king and he's allowed to spread his kind of ideology, this sort of anti Tenrubito ideology to his citizens, and that might grow into other kingdoms, and the world government didn't want that. So it's like, we got to cut this out at the root. We got to get rid of Kuma, all right? And so Kuma left. So it's either that, I mean, he might have been in talks with Dragon and the Revolutionary Army while he was still the king, because obviously he would have been very sympathetic to their cause. He might have even, like, allowed them to stay on the island. Like how uh, the Ishin Dojo on Shimosuke Village, they allowed Dragon to stay there after the whole thing with the Goa Kingdom and the Grey Terminal incident. We, we see that. Maybe it was the same thing with the Sorbet Kingdom. Lindbergh might have been involved as well because Lindbergh was the commander of the South uh, Territory of the Revolutionary Army. So it might have been, like, the Sorbet Kingdom could have been a place where Dragon... That might have been Dragon's home base of operations back then. I I imagine the Revolutionary Army has probably changed locations for their headquarters a few times, okay? So it might have been Sorbet back in the day, and then they moved to Baltigo, and they had to move again recently to Kamabaka, okay? It might have had to been a situation like that. As the headquarters for the Revolutionary Army, it's probably a good idea to move periodically anyway, you know what I mean? So, yeah, there's, there's probably some other reasons. Maybe Kuma left of his own free will, or through some manip- well, not, not his own free will, but through, like, an ultimatum given to him by the government, or the government directly gets involved and frames him, and then he has to leave that way, okay? So, at any rate, though, he becomes a member of the Revolutionary Army. This is the time in his life where we see him during the Goa Kingdom. In the background there, we see Ivankov, we see Dragon, we see Kuma, when Sabo was rescued and everything like that in the fire, okay? Now, at this moment, um, Kuma and Dragon have a very close relationship with each other. Here's something interesting. The only person in the Revolutionary Army that knew that Luffy was Dragon's son, that knew anything about Dragon's family, period, was Kuma. Ivankov did not know. Koala did not know. Sabo obviously had amnesia at the time. Uh, all of the other commanders, Bello Betty, Karasu, Lindbergh, and Morley, did not know. The only person that knew was Kuma, okay? And this was also something that uh, when Kuma was uh, uh, with Rayleigh there, when Kuma was at Sabaori Archipelago and, like, teleported over to Rayleigh really quick and, like, hey, I'm a member of the Revolutionary Army. I'm, I'm a friend of Dragon. You know, I know Luffy is Dragon's son, blah, 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 blah. I'm here to help you out. You know, like, that was whole that whole thing was explained, okay? Um, it was also revealed, uh, oh, yeah, it was also revealed when Ivankov got out of Impel Down. Ivankov had no idea, fighting against Kuma at Marineford, what happened to him. So afterwards, Ivankov radioed uh, Dragon over the Den Den Mushi and was like, what happened to Kuma? I, he's a robot now. What happened? And then at that point, Dragon was like, oh, yeah, well, let me tell you all about Kuma. So th this is a very secretive operation Kuma becoming a pacifista, going to work with Vegapunk. This is, like, something most of the Revolutionary Army do not know about, but Dragon knows about it. So I think this was whole part of a plan, all right? So I, I drew up a little timeline here, okay? So Kuma leaves the Sorbet Kingdom. 
becomes a member of the Revolutionary Army full-time. Maybe he was just a part-time guy at that point. But he becomes a full-time member of the Revolutionary Army, travels around, gets captured by the world government. Now, I circled captured. Was he captured, or was this a plan by Dragon? Because Dragon and Kuma were working closely together. I feel like he was not captured by accident. I feel, or just happen chance. I feel like this was something like Roger turning himself in, where, rather, Kuma made it look... Like, he got captured, like, oh no, I was sailing by myself, and then all of a sudden the world government captured me. Oh no, whatever shall I do? You know, it might have been something like that. He ends up in the hands of the world government. That's when Vegapunk speaks up, and Vegapunk is like, hey, don't kill him. You know, he has a very powerful body. I could use him for research. So then Vegapunk gives him a pardon. He becomes working, uh, he goes to work for him at Egghead, you know, part of the Pacifista program. Uh, and then he becomes a warlord at that point. Why would the government make him a warlord when he was this king that did not ally with them? For a few reasons. Number one, at that point, Vegapunk had probably modified him enough so that, you know, the world government could, you know, he's like, oh, we don't have to worry about Kuma betraying us because Vegapunk modified him, not realizing that Vegapunk also might have been working for the Revolutionary Army. But also, probably just for the government's stance of like, hey, you know, uh, this is what happens to people that are dissenters. This is what happens to people of the Revolutionary Army. We take them, remove their brains, and then make them robotic soldiers to fight for us. You know, that that's kind of the uh, message probably the Gorosei and Eam and the Tenorubito wanted to spread, all right? So there you go. You have this kind king that was loved by everybody that was against the world government, and you basically turn him into a slave. And, uh, you know, PX0 remove all of his memories, effectively killing him and use him as a pack mule in the Celestial Dragon City. I could not think of a better way that the Tenorubito would want to get back to Kuma, you know, to get their message across, you know what I mean? So, and now he's the PX0 where he's at right now. Uh, well, right now, now, he's at the Kamabaka Kingdom, and he spoke to Dragon, and he even called Dragon Master. He was just like, yes, Master, I will tell you all that I know, after Dragon asked him, you know, what did you see at, at uh, Marijua Kuma? So I, I assumed maybe it was like whatever order Kuma would is, was given because he's a robot now, essentially, he would respond that way. But no, it might have been a situation where Vegapunk was programming Kuma as the PX0. He'd be like, OK, you're going to listen to the Tenorubito because you have to to keep up the, the, the facade. But if you ever meet Dragon, you will also listen to anything that he says, too. You will answer any questions that Dragon gives you. Dragon is your true friend, your true commander. OK, and so that's the person that you're going to obey. So now, you essentially have the perfect, uh, you know, undercover operative. You have Bartholomew Kuma that got turned into a PX-0 right before the time skip. It was confirmed at Marine Fort. That's when he became a PX-0, shortly before that, okay? So that means for two years now, Kuma has been walking around Marijua, the Holy Land, the, the Heavenly Dragon City. That might be the most brilliant, like, operation ever. Now, it also required a lot of sacrifice on Kuma's end of things, but how else would you get anybody into the Tenerubito city that would be able to gather information on them? Rather than remove all of your memories, turn you into a mindless robot, and then throw them away, and be like, okay, this once kind king, you know, we'll show him, you know, we'll turn him into a slave, and then the Tenerubito, the Tenerubito were probably riding him around, talking about their plans and everything like that. Kuma's hearing everything, he's listening to everything, it's all logged into his memory banks or whatever, and then he manages to get away, and then he's now able to tell Dragon all the hot gossip on the Tenerubito that he's learned in the last two years. He might not know that he learned it because he's not really in there anymore he is just a robot but somebody had to do this and so kuma volunteered he's like okay uh dragon got in touch with vegapunk they came up with this plan like okay vegapunk is like hey dragon i have this thing called the pacifista project what i could do is i could take one of your men transform them into a mindless robot now hold on here and then they will get into the good graces of the Tenrobito. The Tenrobito won't care because they'll just think he's a robot and they can say whatever they want around him. So we could get a lot of information about the, the world government and the Tenrobito. And then he could go back to you and then relay all of that. However, it will require one of your men to lose all of their, you know, their, their sense of self, essentially. And uh, Kuma volunteered for that. And that for that reason, Kuma and Dragon were privy to information between themselves that no one else knew about, even the other commanders in the Revolutionary Army. Not even Sabo, who was the chief of staff, who was arguably the second in command of the entire army, did not know about this, okay? Because when he went to Reverie, he saw Kuma there. He's like, how could they do that to Kuma? He didn't know about the plan, okay? So, um, yeah, that, that's the only way it could have worked. The only people that knew about this, there were only four individuals, Dragon, Vegapunk, 
Kuma, and I miscounted. So there's only there's only three. There's only three people. All right, I suck at math. We all know this. Okay, so Vegapunk, Kuma, and Dragon. Technically, only Vegapunk and Dragon right now because Kuma had all of his memories wiped. Okay, so there we go. Yeah. Um, with that being said, uh, I think he will get his memories back at some point, like I stated, and then he might explain to Bonnie and the Straw Hats that ex exactly what happened to him. Uh, Dragon is in talks with Vegapunk right now, so maybe you know he'll explain some stuff about the Revolutionary Army. Then we get into the whole thing about him being a member of a of a special race, and so I immediately jump to Lunarian because there's been a lot of hullabaloo about Lunarians as of late, and uh, they already got the DNA from King, but also maybe if Kuma is like half Lunarian, or maybe there's like Lunarian Lunarian ancestry back far enough. Maybe he's only like one eighth Lunarian or one sixteenth or whatever, but he still has the DNA that Vegapunk could use. Maybe it would help make the Seraphim. Uh, maybe the Seraphim of Kuma is actually where Kuma's memories are. That's another theory that's been bouncing around, okay? Like, literally, Vegapunk just used Kuma's own DNA, puts it into the Seraphim version of Kuma, and then that's the Kuma that understands everything and remembers who he actually was, okay? Restarted life as a Seraphim. Could be something like that. Um, now, Lunarians do have black wings. We've never really seen Kuma's back. Uh, even when he was a kid, he was carrying the wood around on his back, you know, the, the firewood. So maybe he does have wings. Uh, maybe he just covers them up with his coat. Maybe he removed them, or maybe Vegapunk removed them so that it wasn't as obvious anymore. Maybe he dyes his hair, or maybe if the Lunarian ancestry is back far enough, then um, he would just have regular, like, black hair, and then maybe his white hair, maybe that's something that doesn't carry over because of, like, the recessive genes or whatever. I'm not really sure. I'm not a biologist. Um, but, yeah, it's it's very possible he could be a Lunarian. Uh, people have thrown around some other ideas, like maybe he's part of a race that hasn't even been introduced in One Piece yet, uh, very much like how Lunarians were just introduced. Maybe there's another one that we don't know about. It was mentioned uh, that Big Mom uh, only had three races that were that were not part of Totland, that were not in her perfect, you know, country right now, okay? One of them was Giants, we know that. The other one she mentioned was King's Race, which were the Lunarians. So what about the third one? I always assumed the third race that was not part of Big Mom's country of Totland was uh, the Skypeans, or the Bierkins, or the Shandorians. Uh, anybody that has, like, the, the, the wings on their back, the regular white wings on their back that we saw during, you know, the Skypea arc and everything like that. Um, we didn't see any Skypeans, Bierkins, or Shandorians all throughout Totland, so I just assumed that was the race that Big Mom was talking about. I mean, I guess it kind of goes along with the same thing that maybe, um, you know, uh, Kuma might not be part of the Lunarians, he might just be a Bierkin or something, and the Bierkins aren't around anymore because Enaru wiped them all off. Enaru also removed the wings from his back, so it, there's a precedent that maybe, you know, uh, Kuma did that as well. A Rouge, here's a fun thing. Kuma and a Rouge are the same age. They were born both 47 years ago, so there might be a connection there. Maybe a Rouge is Kuma's brother. That makes way too much sense now that I'm actually thinking about it. Aruj's whole thing is like, I'm a Buddhist monk. And Kuma's, you know, when he was a kid, inspired by Ninomiya Kinjiro, was a big student of Buddhism, Shinto, and Confucianism. Confucianism? Confucius. He followed Confucius. Um, the teachings of Confucius. Uh, wow. Wow. Now, now, okay, there's still some problems with that because he was born in the South. Well, maybe, maybe Kuma's father was a Bierkin. Maybe Kuma's father was a Bierkin, lived in the sky. That's where Aruz was born, but they were born the same year. I have to look at the, uh, the heights, because Kuma's really tall. Hold on, I'm going to go check that really quick. Kuma's height versus Aruz's height. I want to see something here. Okay, we're going to do this in real time. All right, Kuma is... 689 centimeters tall. That is 22 feet 7 inches. So 6.89 meters. Okay. Now let's look at Aruj's height. I'm telling you what, if Aruj's height lines up with this, oh, we might have something to go on here. Okay, so Aruj is a little smaller. He's a little shorter. 388 centimeters, only 12 feet tall. But he does have the devil fruit power that increases his size, but that's a devil fruit power. I don't know if that has anything to do with maybe that's how he actually, maybe that's how big he originally is, and maybe the devil fruit makes him smaller. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that. But, you know, you look at Kuma, you look at Aruj, they're both the same age, and uh, they both have kind of like the Buddhism, like monk, you know, kind individual sort of, uh, you know, aspect going with them that were turned pirates at some point. 
Um, maybe, I don't know. And also, Rouge is, like, the only member of the Supernovas that has not really been, like, explored in terms of backstory yet. And uh, now that we're dealing with Bonnie and Rouge were the only two, and now that we're dealing with Bonnie's stuff, you know, Oda might just throw Rouge into this arc as well. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. That was kind of something I just realized right here and now. But they are the same age, and... Maybe we haven't seen Kuma's back if he has wings, or maybe he removed his wings and the Bierkins aren't around anymore, so him being considered like, well, okay, here's the thing, though. If Kuma was... When was Kuma captured by the revolutionary... Oh, I mean, when was Kuma captured by the world government? That is a big question. When did that happen? We do not know when that happened. Um... Because Bierka was wiped out by Eneru six years before uh, the pre-time skip. So I guess it would have been eight years ago now. So if Kuma was captured at any point prior to eight years ago, then that would mean that the Bierkans were still around. But maybe it was eight years ago when Bierka was wiped out. And so, oh, crap, there's not a lot of Bierkans anymore. Kuma might be one of the only ones left, you know, or one of the very few of them left. You know, the uh, Eneru's priests were Bierkans. Eneru was a Bierkan. Eruj is a Bierkan. Um, technically Haradus is a Bierkin because he was born in Bierka, but he might not be actually a member of the race. He might have just been born there. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure about this. This is, this is interesting. I sat down to do a video about Bartholomew Kuma and, uh, iron out all the situations of his life and, uh, ended up having more questions by the end of it. Um, so I guess the biggest ones here, just from what everything I wrote down, um, who was Kuma's father? Uh, was Kuma's mother Connie? I think she probably was, but if that's the case, who was Kuma's father? Uh, who was Kuma's wife? That's kind of a big deal. Did Kuma have uh, any other kids other than Bonnie? Um, also, I guess, mm, okay, I guess you could argue because if Kuma was a Lunarian or was a Skypian, wouldn't that also mean that uh, Bonnie would also have wings as well? I guess that's a hole in the problem there. Um, you know, uh, the whole situation of how did Kuma leave the island, that's another question. Was there an uprising, or did he leave under other circumstances? Um, let's see here. When did he get captured by the world government, and what was the process of that, and when did he start working with Dragon and Vegapunk? So those are the big questions I guess we have there. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll leave it to you in the comment section if you want to, you know, talk about where that's going. Uh, thanks for watching the video, everybody. Good to be back, Barry, and all that. And uh, now let's go to some narwhal facts. That seems like a good way to end this out. Yeah. Narwhals, narwhals, swimming in the ocean. Pretty big and pretty wide to beat a polar bear in a fight. <laughs> All right, so I got some pretty simple ones for you here. Uh, narwhals, uh, interesting with their skin, okay? So when they're born, their skin is like bluish gray, and then they, as they mature, it becomes bluish black, and then just regular gray, and you can tell the age of a narwhal just based off their, um, like, because if they're more white, then that means that they're really old, okay? To the point where, uh, like, one of the oldest narwhals that can live up to, like, 50 years, um, their entire bodies are essentially white at that point, okay? So that's a good way to tell the age of a narwhal. And in the case of life expectancy, yeah, they can live 25 to 50 years. I like to think there's a really ancient narwhal, though, living out there somewhere in the Arctic. I like to think there's, like, an 80-year-old narwhal, like, living out there in the bottom of the ocean, like, in the ice flows or something. That just, you know mysterious and all that. Anyway, it's Narwhal Facts. Hope you enjoyed. I don't know how many more of these we're going to get, but uh, I am excited for Octopus Facts after this. That's going to be a lot of fun. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Teching, signing out.